So compliance is hard. I'm sure um, you've all been in those situations where you want to go and do something and someone's come along and said, no, you cannot do that because of X, Y, and Z. Now, I think from a DevOps capability perspective, DevOps is a fantastic way of satisfying most of the requirements that your compliance people have. And so today, we're going to talk about some of those things, some of the challenges that you will face, whether you're on the compliance side or the dev side, and how we can make it work. So part of the challenge with DevOps is people see the compliance piece as this whole automation thing and going really fast. I had conversations this morning about we want to go faster and actually you need to slow down to actually get more done. And I think we need to address those fears that people have about DevOps is all about shipping code every second of every day um, and the fears that people have around that. So I'm Simon Sabin. I run a data consultancy. Our whole premise is around data DevOps. Um, worked in the data industry for, for 22 years, so compliance has always been a strong thing. We've been the people that govern and manage data, and so we're always sort of friends with the compliance person, and uh, we need to see and how we can make it work. And so our whole business premise is about yeah, making a DevOps practice work from that data platform perspective, uh, and we've got a good, strong uh, perspective of how we can make that work from a compliance perspective. I run SQL Bits, data conference in the UK. If you do anything in data, then SQL Bits is a good place to go. Uh, yeah, and I'm passionate about DevOps. Out of interest, what sort of spread have we got here? I mean, how many people would say they're devs in this audience? And how many people would say they're sort of compliance people? Okay. Now, clearly, this probably needs to just be a fight, yeah? Because <laughs> clearly, the compliance people are always right, and the devs are always wrong. Or if you're sitting on the other side of the fence, the devs are trying to do something, and the compliance people are going, no, that's not fair. So we're going to look at how we're going to go through that. Have a look about, actually, what is compliance? What are we actually looking at? Um, then maybe some of the fears and some of the facets that mean that compliance people and compliance process um, is um, people have got fears about a DevOps process. Then look at DevOps intrinsically. What are the facets of DevOps that make it work very well for compliance? Um, and then look at some of the detail of DevOps and how that solves your compliance story. And fundamentally at the end is look at, okay, how do we, how do we resolve some of those fears that people will have um, and help you get on your DevOps journey? Uh, we've talked a lot about, or heard a lot this morning about people's perception, people's fears, people's goals. Um, you've got to get those things aligned to be successful. And hopefully today you'll uh, understand, understand some of those aspects. So what is compliance? So is it a definition of how, or is it a set of requirements? How many people reckon it's a definition of how you should do something? And how many people think it's a set of requirements? Good. I think invariably what we generally see often um, is compliance is seen as this definition of how. You must do it like this. And I think part of the challenge is the fact that the way that we do things now is different to how things occurred a year ago, two years ago, ten years ago. Technology is evolving, technology is changing. If you've got a compliance person that's coming along and saying, you must do it like this, the problem is they've taken ownership of how to do it, and that means that you can't solve that requirement yourselves based on the technology you have. And so really understanding that it is a set of requirements, not a this is how you should do it, is really critical. And what it really is is a set of requirements to manage risk. And part of that risk is about preventing stuff going wrong, controlling access to stuff, um, and detecting when things have gone wrong. So we can break compliance down into some security aspects, some controlling what you can do. Um, there's some other aspects of compliance that, who's works in the financial sector? Okay, what other compliance areas? I mean, health, banking, finance, 
what any other compliance we talked about publishing anyone got any other comments so one of the aspects of finance that's come out so I used to work for Wonga so don't beat me up but it's a very good learning experience about how to do things well and how to do things badly but one of the things that we chipped ourselves up with was the compliance about understanding how we were doing things we were one of the very first in terms of applying AI to decision making in terms of taking loans out but we didn't really have a good enough process for managing um, and understanding the thoughtfulness the decision behind the process of making change compliance isn't just about control it's also about understanding how you are actually doing things um, and whether you're doing things in an accurate way and making sure that you are able to maintain things one of the aspects for PCI is the fact that you are keeping your servers up to date if you're not keeping your servers up to date then you're not going to be compliant because the perception is that if you're not keeping them up to date you'll be um, vulnerable to security threats etc and so you need to keep things maintained but automated change is risky how many people are finding that as being one of the big problems for um, implementing some DevOps capability in their organization most of you um, and part of that is because don't take this the wrong way devs but we have lots of problems when we don't have a DevOps process we have people accessing production making changes to production we have too much access to production data and we've all heard about vulnerabilities in terms of um, data breaches often those are phishing attacks which are because someone's got the wrong permissions to production people are making unauthorized changes there's very little traceability in how we are making changes we're also um, looking at the reliability of systems so part of the challenge is the fact that from a compliance perspective people think about the general development experience and go well if you're going to automate that that means you're going to do that even worse um, and so we don't want you to do that in a DevOps way so the aim of today is to understand how we can make it so that compliance isn't that roadblock to adoption so why is DevOps good anyone tell me why DevOps might be good from a compliance story or is that why you're here right. give me the answers I, one of my big things is compliance it, DevOps is not CICD um, there's lots of definitions of DevOps I'm very pleased to see the talks earlier basically taking DevOps and treating it as this uber thing it's not just about continuous delivery and continuous integration it's about this mentality about how you build software how you deliver change and so it's not just about CICD and I think this is critical to make sure and address those compliance aspects it's about this continuous feedback loop we think about something we build it we ship it we look to see what's going on we monitor it we test it and we carry on that loop whether it's at the macro level where as a developer you're writing code get that little squiggly line in your IDE to telling you you've done something wrong got to go fix it to the uber level you ship some software you find a bug because you've got some monitoring in production and that's coming back around and you're fixing that bug to the business as a whole has got a goal to try and be hundred million dollars they're not hitting it so they go okay we're missing this market we're gonna go and add some features to try and hit that market add that into the loop has it worked no okay do some iterations so from the macro level as you as a developer at your machine right up to the company level that whole DevOps mentality if we see the high functioning teams the guys from the West Coast that um, was talked about earlier the 
the Ubers, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the Etsys. The mentality of the company is all about that um, continuous process. And I think this is probably one of the biggest challenges if you're trying to do DevOps just within your team and you have compliance people imposing things on top of you, then you've got a big challenge. Trying to broaden that reach so that everyone understands the value and the goal of what you're trying to achieve is really important. For me, DevOps, it's about this collaboration of people. Um, it's using an agile pro process to change, and that change is delivered in a continuous way. It's automated, it's tested, it's monitored, testing and monitoring. There's an interesting talk about whether you do monitoring and testing. We'll talk about that later. Um, and the prioritization of feedback to make decisions. Those are all crucially important. If we start looking at continuous integration, one of the big benefits is the fact that we have automated testing. If we have automated testing, then in theory it should reduce risk. If we have small changes, if we change a little thing, the likelihood of that thing impacting what we're our user base and our systems, we're reducing risk. If we have a quick feedback loop, so we understand when things have gone wrong, then we're able to respond quickly and thus reduce risk. And so we end up with this quick cycle of being able to fix things quickly. If we take that con to continuous delivery, and we have automated deployments, so with automated deployments, we don't have people involved in the process. How many people have had a release where someone's gone, oh, actually, I think we should do this, made a little change to a script, and ended up breaking the system? I have. I think we've all had. Right. Having that reliability because you have a consistent process is uber important. Production-like testing, having testing within your continuous delivery process, having a repeatable process, so you're delivering in multiple environments before you get to production. All of these things reduce the risk of making your changes. And if you're using a continuous delivery piece of software, Jenkins, Team City, Azure DevOps, having that traceability back to um, source back to the decision, back to the check-in, means that you've got that lineage of change, which also helps reduce risk. If you know there's traceability about what you're going to do, you might think about whether you're going to do this in a hacky way or whether you're going to do things properly. So DevOps, small change, small risk. Frequent release gives us familiarity reduces risk. Continuously, we are detecting things quickly. That's going to reduce risk. The reliability enables automation. How many people have actually, are on a DevOps journey already, have already got some continuous delivery in place? How many are just starting? Interesting, okay. How many of you that, that have already got something in place, try to automate things, and had failures in your automation process. The, what was the impact of when those things failed and you tried to run quickly? Pretty catastrophic. Yeah. If you're trying to, if you've got little failures in your delivery process, and someone is, you, you split out to 10 teams and you're trying to do all these releases, those little things just become decimating problems that get really in the way. If you don't have that reliability, you can't get to that level of automation. And that's really important. It's a bit of a sort of catch-22, um, the fact that if you have that automation, then you're not going to sit there and, and not have the reliability, because otherwise your, your process will grind to a halt. Monitoring. 
How many people do testing? How many people don't do testing? Oh, and, oh, and us. Um, how many people are doing monitoring in production? OK, most of you. Interesting. So my perspective, monitoring is more important than testing. It's more important to understand when something goes wrong in production than it is to test things before they get to production. Okay. There's an argument that says, well, you need to have that testing as well, and I would agree, but if you don't know when something has gone wrong in, wrong in production, you can't respond to it. And invariably, how many people struggle replicating their production workload in their test environments? Almost everybody I speak to. You want to have that big data volume because you've got 100 gigs of data and 10, 000, 10 million customers, and you want to replicate that in your dev environment, your test environment, well, your compliance person is going to go, oh, don't like that. So it becomes really difficult. So uh, you have these challenges. So monitoring in production is really important. And then automation. Once you have got automation, you have this consistent approach and consistency leads to um, reduced risk. So those are the fundamental things about DevOps that I think make things work about um, compliance. And so if we map these together, we've got a whole set of requirements about the requirements for your um, compliance story and how they really map to some of the facets of a DevOps mentality. And you can see that there's, they just all link together. Almost everything that you need from a compliance perspective is solved from something with a DevOps perspective. Now, clearly, if you don't do some of these things in your DevOps world, then you're not going to meet the requirement in your compliance world. But if you do, then you're in a good place. So how in detail? Security. So your security people want to go and control who has access to production, who has access to, access to what systems. Uh, do we have good controls? How many people are deploying their infrastructure with DevOps? With a, you know, I mean, that's probably one of the first things that often people do. Um, if you're doing that from code, the great thing is that you can relate back to your code and you've got that audit of change. So defining your security in your pipeline means that you've got that traceability. Now, what that means is that you've got all those benefits you've got from your, I mean, people using Git, who's not using Git? What, subversion? TFS, TFEC, or I'm not sure which is worse. At least it's not source safe. Anyone using source safe? No? Okay, cool, good. I, whatever Git platform you've got, the pull request review process is very rich. Um, and so having that peer review, having that approval process within your source control process is essential. Now, you don't have that with a script that someone's stuck on a file share that someone's going to run on your production system. So having your security defined in that way gives you ultimate control. You can have that change audited and recorded because it's in your source control. You've got the traceability because you've got the traceability in your <coughs> development pipeline. Your security is then verified. You can put testing in place on your security. Can you access something through your firewall? Can you access things from outside your firewall? Can you put testing in place to verify that security? All of those things are possible from an automated perspective. Well, probably one of the big things for me from a um, data perspective, if you are got a good dev DevOps process and you've got good local testing, I'm a massive believer that a dev should be able to test totally locally, whether it's containers or local installs you've got this very rich capability that your dev doesn't need to have access to the production data and the, that data that is very valuable and 
and very sensitive. If you've got a good process, then that's essential. And then that solves huge amounts of security worries that your compliance people will have. And so having the automated testing then means that you can, I mean, some people will disagree, take your production data and put it in a test environment to do some validation against that. If you're building any data manipulation system, so any sort of business intelligence, warehouse, machine learning, trying to do that on non-real data is almost impossible. Yeah? SKUs of data become critical, so you have to, in my view, use production data. But you have to control that in a controlled way. If you've got that locked down in a test environment that your code goes through before it gets to production, you've got a real powerful capability to do that testing in a secure and controlled way. So that's the security aspect. Yeah. You can define security across your infrastructure, across your applications and your services, and you've got full auditability about what is being done. Thoughtfulness and decision making. How do we know why we did this? How many people, bosses said, oh, can you just make this change? And a change has been made into production. And we've all done it. Yeah. You've got Friday afternoon, someone wants to do something for the weekend, someone comes along and goes, oh, you've got to make this change because we've got a sales pitch next week and we've got to make a change. Yeah. All of these things become very critical. Now, my belief is if you have got an automated process, that stuff becomes really quick and easy because you can shift that change into production quickly through your pipeline. But having that traceability is really critical. And I think this is one of the things that people miss out in the whole DevOps capability. People talk about automating code, etc. But that whole traceability is something that I think is very rich. Any system, so this is a work item in Azure DevOps. And so I've got traceability that shows I created a work item to add the IP address so I can do some testing for a demo tomorrow. Um, and one of my colleagues approved the work item. There's links back to a branch that has made my, got my change in it. And if I look at the pull request, the pull request has been approved by one of my colleagues. That relates back to the work item and also to the branch so I can see the code change. Oh, I've merged it in, so the code change got merged into master. And so I can see the change, which has added the IP address for this place. Um, and if I look at the release that has released this into my Azure environment, I can see the work item and the commit that is related to it. And so you have this good traceability all the way back to um, your work item discussion. So that whole thoughtfulness about why we did something, that social coding aspect of de building your um, description about what should happen, how it should happen, making sure your code then <coughs> matches that, making sure your tests match the expected criteria in the work item, then making sure that when you've um, committed it, it's gone through those tests of run, it then gets into your release process and you've got approvals to make sure that you can approve it through that process. And you've got that full traceability. How many people are using Azure DevOps? Jenkins? Atlassian? Who's using Jira? Interesting. So like, with all of these things, you can pretty much connect them all together. I'm a big fan of Azure DevOps because it's all in one place, but they can all generally be plugged together. And plugging them together means that you can provide reporting and traceability from release all the way back to your work items, your stories. And it might not, it might, it's pretty hard to do that in a standard automated report way, but from an audit perspective, doing it on a piecemeal occasionally go back and tracing what things have been done is important. 
and is possible. And what's more, almost all of the tools allow you to define policies in some form. So this is a PR policy for um, making branches. So we've got to have a reviewer, we've got to have work items linked. All of those things are possible um, and make the story um, a lot easier for you and means people can't circumvent things. So why did we make the change? Who approved it? Um, yeah. Why did we delete some data? Um, who decided that the functionality should be like this rather than like this? Like we should give loans to these people, not to these people. All of those decisions become very interesting from a compliance perspective. And the collaboration aspect at the start of your journey of building stories in your sprint planning is recorded within your story management work item tool. And then that flows all the way through your check-ins, your PRs, through to your releases, all the way through to production. So one of the biggest things about compliance is often the controls. People want to control what you're going to do. And ideally, you want dual responsibility. And they want people to own who's making that change. So DevOps gives you, invariably on all processes, whether it's approving work items, whether it's approving PRs, whether it's PR reviewing your PRs, whether it's approving your releases, you can put that level of control in there if you want to. Some would argue that you shouldn't have to because um, it should be an automated process. But going from zero to hero, how many people are building new software? How many people are managing legacy systems that need some DevOps love sprinkled on top of it? Yeah? Invariably, we are now at that stage where DevOps is being adopted by the wider enterprise organizations that have got that really crappy application that is a nightmare to automate. Yeah? You don't have any testing. You don't have any monitoring. Trying to get a build is bad enough. Now, you're not going to get to an automated click, shift, deploy process immediately. That is not going to happen. Yeah? Thanos is not going to suddenly give you a whole load of testing. So you're going to have to put some manual processes in there into that process to verify what's going on. That's a journey that you've got to go through. But you can put those approvals, and there's lots of means of doing that in all the tools you've got. And engaging with your compliance people to understand that is really important. Accuracy. So functionality should be verified. Um, it's your testing will give you what you need. And um, your testing is there to verify that functionality. But you're not going to get testing for everything. Not automated testing, anyway. That testing is there to provide that comfort. That means that you know you're doing what you're doing. And it means your compliance people know that they can look and see, right, these are the tests that validated that the system is performing how it should be performing. And then monitoring. Once it's running, are you doing the right thing? Do the right people have access to production? Do the people have the right um, access to the source control systems? Are people logging into the source control systems correctly? Um, all of those things can be audited, monitored, to means, make sure that you are meeting your compliance story, not just about the compliance of your DevOps process, but the compliance of the management of your systems. And the benefit of the whole uh, cloud is you can generally automate all of that stuff now, which is fantastic. So yeah, monitoring, for me, is more important than testing. So options for success. So we said how DevOps is great for a compliance story. Um, but how do you actually address those things? Now, it is a long road. Uh, if you're trying to apply a DevOps capability on top of an existing system, it's going to be a long road. 
probably the biggest thing for me is many organizations, how many people have got sort of compliance teams within their organization? How many people have got compliance teams outside of their organization? Okay. They probably have indirectly related to your compliance teams internally with your organization. Now, for me, this is what we see in a dysfunctional system. You as your team, so imagine the, the guy in the middle is your team, you go off to the compliance people and you get the compliance person to do the auditing, do the reporting, do the testing of your system to make sure it's compliant. Now, the, if you were in any of the sessions earlier, that autonomy is really important. Now, if you are doing this and you're going off to your legal, your security, your compliance person, all of these external people to go and do things for you, you're sort of asking them to take responsibility for checking your system. That's not going to enable you to be autonomous. What you need to do is get the requirements from them about what they need and you implement it. If you implement it and you make sure you're running those things, it means you can be autonomous and you're not going to get blocked by those compliance people saying, oh, you haven't done this. If they give you the requirement that says, do this, and you implement that in a way that works for your system because you're using Mongo, Cassandra, SQL, whatever, some serverless, some containers, some Kubernetes, then you can implement it and get agreement that you've implemented it to their satisfaction. And then once that's implemented and those tests are in place, fantastic. You've now got your seatbelts on and you can go fast. You've taken responsibility of what that requirement is and implementing that requirement. It's really crucial you do that. The other facet is we talked about this morning that who's in the keynote? Everybody? Most people? So you have this conversation in a meeting and you walk out of the meeting. I've got one thought. You've got another thought. Someone else has got another thought. If you write it down as a test that says, I'm going to test this, it's hard to do that because someone goes, oh, I'm not sure what you need to test. Well, if you're not sure what I need to test to be compliant, we're a bit stuck, aren't we? You need to be able to get those things written down. And if they're written down, invariably, you can codify them and write them as code and automate them. Who does um, um, sort of code standard checks? Yeah. You want camel case of this and you want this of that. Now, who wants to check those things manually? No one. Yeah? You want to codify them. If they're important, you want to codify them. If they're not important, don't do them. But getting those requirements down is really important. So shifting the responsibility onto you, so you're responsible. I'm not responsible as the data guy to make sure your store procs work properly. You're responsible. I can't be responsible because it's your code. You know how it works. So shift that ownership and that responsibility onto yourself so you can take responsibility and you can get that stuff done. If you can't, that's perfectly fine. You need to understand that if you can't shift that responsibility and someone else has to do it, that's a blocker to your process. So you need to understand how you can resolve that or you just have to work around it. If you keep battling it and it's not changing, it's wasted effort. Accept it, move on, spend time on something that is going to be um, productive and get you to where you want to get to. So, are you building new or applying to old? If you're building, to, building a new system uh, or in all situations, you need to get everyone on board. Yeah. This is a collaborative thing. We are, as an organization, want to hit this goal. If you can't agree between yourselves and the compliance people what the goal is, then 
you're going to go in two different directions. And that is not going to work. Bringing everyone together and getting an agreed goal, this is what we're trying to achieve. Now, that is probably the hardest thing that I can say in, I would say, the dysfunctional enterprise organizations that we work at. You have people that, sadly, don't know the goal, and they just have their own little world, and they want to make sure that their own little world is safe. Or there is no one taking responsibility for what needs to get done, and so you end up in this sort of wishy-washy world of a compliance person saying, oh, well, you need to do X, but won't actually define what X is, which is very difficult. Um, but getting that ownership of um, the compliance requirements is important, and then you taking responsibility of the implementation is then critical. Don't do waterfall. How many people do agile? How many people do waterfall? I like it. So lots of people take a waterfall approach to compliance. They go, right, and then write code, write code, write code, write code, write code, write code, write code. Right, is it compliant? Oh, bugger. Got to go back here and start making changes. If you take your compliance things, they are just requirements. You need to take those things and treat them as non-functional requirements and put them in the process. You cannot just suddenly get to the end and go flip. We are going to be compliant. It's not going to work. Yeah. That's like saying suddenly you've added a whole set of new requirements and suddenly they're magically going to go up here. The likelihood is unlikely. So take it on board throughout the journey. These are just requirements, just like the guy that needs to check out with Apple Pay. That is just a requirement, just as you need to make sure that security audits are in place. Yeah? They are just requirements. If you are taking on old, understanding it's a journey, this is probably the biggest message for anybody on that DevOps thing, is it's a journey, so make sure you understand that and you can't click your fingers and it suddenly be magic. You need to prioritize what is important and prioritize what you're going to automate. So speed of change. If people are fearful of speed of change, then get those requirements agreed up front. Once you've got those requirements agreed about what people are happy to test to enable you to release, once those are in place, then you should be able to release based on their, the compliance person's requirement of um, the fact you've put that testing in place. If you haven't put that testing in place, then you shouldn't be able to go fast. Right? Is your system a mission-critical system, like healthcare, prescribing drugs? That if you get it wrong, someone's going to die. Yeah? That's bad. Failure in that situation is bad. Yeah? Are you writing Twitter that someone's tweet might get missed? Yeah, who gives a... Yeah? Understand where you're sitting. Yeah? Failure, everyone talks about failure. Failure's great, but you've got, there's different degrees of failure. Yeah? We don't want to kill people. Yeah? Tweets, maybe. Um, once you've got... Once you've put some things in place, track how long it's taking to do those things that the compliance person wants to do in terms of approvals, etc. Track those times. If they are taking time and they're impacting your value about being able to deliver, then have that conversation. We're wasting this time because of this. Is this checking that you're putting in place adding any value? All our tests are capturing stuff. No, fine, well, let's not do it unless just automatically release. Get the information and be the person with the most information in the room to um, persuade the, uh, to get rid of those manual verifications. Uncontrolled change. So you can put policies in place to make sure that you have that controlled change going through that process. Work item discussions, PR requests, multi-stage testing, all of these things you can put in place to give people confidence that this isn't a Wild West. 
you have a controlled change process where I make a change, it goes through a number of stages, it gets validated and gets released. If people want to put manual controls in place, again, if you've got a manual approval and someone is off for a week and so you weren't able to ship because there's one person that can approve a release, that's pretty catastrophic. If you're releasing stuff and not finding bugs in production, then why is he manually approving it? You've got to question that. Get that information and challenge whether they're adding any value in doing that. Failure. I, we talked about different types of failure. Agree what failure is acceptable. Yeah? Some things failure is not acceptable. Some things it is. That then defines what testing you put in place to detect whether things can fail or not. Putting that testing is a prioritization process. For me, a big aspect of DevOps is about prioritizing what you're going to do. Think big, act small, and get those things in priority order. If you're having failures, understand the cost of those failures and what it's going to take to automate some testing to make sure you're not doing those failures. It's a prioritization. Monitor the production, monitor your systems, and understand how you um, drive that um, testing into your system. Loss of control, coming back to the same approval process. Monitor the approval process that is being put in place. And if it's not adding any value, then remove it. Now, some of you will have an enforced requirement for separation of duties. That doesn't mean that the separation of duties needs to be done at the release stage when you get to production. That separation of duties can be done way back here when you go and check your coding. And that way, this, the whole release process and validation can be way more automated. And then thoughtfulness. Show your compliance people that you can trace things back, that there is auditability through your PRs um, all the way back to your work item process. Work, automating this reporting is often hard, so it is often manual, and some things require process to be put in place. Um, so you've got to decide how much you want to put process in place and how much you want the systems to do that for you. So DevOps gives you this traceable change mechanism, a mentality of testing, which makes sure your tests, your code is good quality and going to meet your compliance. You have fewer humans in that process, which means it's more reliable. Automation enables more reliability, more continuous capabilities, and re reduced rel reliance on production data. Monitoring gives you that feedback loop so you know what's going on, and it's a compliance-friendly change process. Start small, implement requirements of tests, be transparent, don't hide things as black boxes, because if a black box occurs, you can't trace what's going in, what's it doing. Have plenty of logs that tell you everything that's going on. The benefit of the cloud, space is free, pretty much. So logs become pretty <coughs> cheap. It's much easier to do that automated in your systems. Include the approvals process and collaborate. And if you do all those things, then your compliance people will love you. You'll be able to ship your code from uh, morning to sunrise and everyone will be happy. Everyone will be ecstatic because you can enable change and you can succeed. And as an organization, you'll be able to succeed. <laughs>